ever wonder how much pollution is in the Pacific Ocean? Well, this week you're in luck, because we had the opportunity to speak with Miriam Goldstein, a fourth-year PhD student at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, about her work as chief scientist of the Seaplex expedition of summer 2009. Have a listen! Um, so our first question was, could you just give us like a general overview of what the Seaplex expedition was like and what the purpose of it was? The purpose it was to go out and find this uh, garbage patch that we'd read a lot about in the mainstream media. So we had seen all these headlines and we're like, okay, there's a garbage island, what? And we realized that really relatively little was known um, about this problem. Uh, so we were like, okay, well we should go out and investigate it. We went out and we didn't really know what we would find. We had all these plans about what if we don't find any plastic, but actually it was really easy because there's so much out there. Uh, as soon as we got a couple hundred miles of California, we started getting visible plastic in every single one of our uh, net toes. So when you tow a very fine net through the water. And it kept on going uh, the whole way while we were out there the whole time. How long were you out there? Uh, three weeks. Um, so where exactly did you go? Like, where in the ocean? Was there did you have like a main place? Or? Yeah, a goal kind of destination. Well, we... Our location was sort of dictated by one science thing and one practical thing. The science thing was we were going to what's called the subtropical high. It's basically a high pressure atmospheric area that is about a thousand miles of California, right between California and Hawaii. Okay. And that's thought to be where the most plastic collects, although that's not really that well established. Um, so we weren't anywhere near the center of the gyre, which is actually the oceanic water moving circulation. Uh, but we were in the center of the high. And the reason we went there is because that's the furthest we could get offshore in the time we had. So that's the, <laughs> okay. practical, uh, the practical consideration. So were you just collecting like plastic samples or did you take samples of maybe like the marine life or anything? Yes, yeah, so we were collecting all different kinds of samples. Uh, the original focus was just on the small stuff. So microbes, phytoplankton, which is the microscopic plants, zooplankton, the tiny animals, uh, fish, the mostly small fish, the what's called mesopelagic fish. Uh, that live in the sort of the twilight zone in the ocean, the the per where the light is, there is light, but there's not very much light. Um, and we also then added a component with birds and whales. For most of those, we were actually collecting animals, not plastic directly. So when you were out there, could you just like you know look out and see plastic, or how was it? Well, yes and visually? no. It's not. A lot of people think it's like a dump or an island or like. Um, you know, sometimes like some places off San Diego after it rains, yeah. but it actually doesn't look like that. The ocean for the most part really looks like normal ocean. It's really a beautiful deep cerulean blue color. The water is very clear and it's very warm because we're in a high pressure zone, so it's permanent good weather. It's very nice. Uh, but we would see like bits and pieces of stuff floating by, but it was not in no way a solid mass. So you'd see, you know, you'd be going along and you'd see like a net float by and you'd see a bottle float by. But it, you see that kind of stuff all over the world, so it didn't really look that shocking to the eye. But what was really surprising was when we would put these fine nets in the water and we would pull up just confetti of these tiny particles, which you can't see with your naked eye. So I would actually look at my net and I'd know there were these little particles going in and I, can't, I couldn't see them at all. Wow. Um, did you get any idea for how, how much um, plastic was actually in the ocean or is it too hard to tell? Well, we definitely won't be able to answer the question of how much plastic is in the ocean, that's for sure, because it did vary a lot. Um, even though we got plastic in every single sample we've looked at so far, um, it, you sometimes you get more and sometimes you get less. And this probably relates to the way the, ocean, the currents go and also the sort of smaller, more temporary currents. Like sometimes you get swirls that come off the California current and swirl off into the gyre, which is called an eddy. And you might get different amounts of plastic in that. These are the one of the, some of the things that we're studying, which is why there's some more some places and less in other places. We even found that it actually varies a lot over pretty small scales, like just in within a 50 miles, sometimes you get more and sometimes you get less. Wow. So we're, but we're counting up what we, what we're working on counting up all, everything that we found. So we'll be able to say how much we saw where we were, but you can't really take it all of the way out to the ocean in general. Would you say that most of it comes from the California coast or? Well, we don't really know. Um, of where, the way the currents go, pretty much everything that falls off the whole coast of North America and the whole coast of, east coast of Asia is going to end up in the gyre. If it doesn't sink and it doesn't biodegrade, it sort of has to go to the gyre. 
So we can't really say where to any specific pieces from though. And then there's the added component of uh, things falling off of boats. So um, the pollution then would come from boats, like storm drains kind of things? Well, in California, yes. Um, in California, you're not allowed to just go like take your kitchen trash and like throw it in the ocean. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> um, which sometimes happens in you know under in countries that don't have good waste disposal systems. So you're not allowed to do it in California, but we actually kind of do do that in a way with our canyons. Uh -huh. So people throw stuff in the canyons all year round, or stuff gets lost and blown into the canyons. And then when it rains, everything that's accumulated for months and months just gushes right out through the storm drains into the ocean. And you can actually see it go, and you can like see it on the beach. Um, yeah. So for us, that's pretty much I think how it gets. So that and with things that just get lost and blown away. Yeah. About the so what is the plastics like how could that be harmful to populations of I don't know animals plants other things in the ocean well there's a couple ways that uh, it could be harmful we definitely know that the big pieces like ghost nets which is sort of big hairballs of lost fishing nets are quite harmful with by entangling things right. so just a net is still a net even if nobody is fishing it yeah so it's going to keep on catching fish and it's going to keep on catching sometimes whales get tangled birds turtles and that's really depressing and sad so we definitely know those kinds kinds of big things are a big problem um with the, these little particles which the vast majority of what we found were these tiny little particles like less than the size of your pinky nail mm -hmm. um there's a couple of ways and we don't know exactly what the case is yet but we're looking at it uh, it could accumulate toxins and then pass it on to animals that interact with it. So we know there's been studies that have shown that these little plastic particles act like sponges to persistent organic pollutants. So that is compounds like PCBs and DDTs that are in the environment and that really like to like suck on to plastic and then it, they like to suck on to fat in animals. And that, that's why they're called persistent. They're always get, they get stuck in the fat and then if another animal like eats a smaller animal, it, that load gets passed on. So it's thought that plastic might be a vector for that, but that's not really been shown out in the ocean yet. Um, so it's one thing that we're looking at. Another way that it could affect the animals is by acting as a transport mechanism. So there are hard surfaces, and normally in the open ocean there should not be very many hard surfaces. You get the occasional like log and piece of pumice, but really you shouldn't <laughs> have you know, this huge amount of area available. So it could transport species that would not normally have been transported, which then could be invasive species. Like in, for example, the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, which are a very sensitive ecosystem. So, um, and those could potentially uh, harm the native populations? Yes, invasive species can be a huge problem by harming the ecosystem well, in lots of different ways, by eating things that aren't used to be eaten or by um, taking over space. So one example of a unpleasant um, invasive species that is sort of a classic is the rat. So when the rat was introduced to all these islands that didn't have rats, it just like ate all the bird eggs and ate all, a lot of the native animals and just like caused a ruckus and a lot of them went extinct because of it. So. Wow. Well, thank you so much oh, for doing welcome. this for us. It's an exciting project. So there you have it, folks. Remember, you can't always see the nasty, but it's still there. Dispose of your waste properly. The ocean will thank you for it.